we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. There is only what is, and not the changing of what is. The changing of what is, is the movement of thought in time. Hello and welcome to episode 211 of Urgency of Change. Each episode of the Krishnamurti podcast features carefully selected clips from our extensive archives. The aim is to represent different aspects of Krishnamurti's radical approach to many of the issues and questions we all face in our lives. This week's theme is What Is? Upcoming themes are Following, Thinking Together and The Unconscious. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust based at Brockwood Park in the UK, which is also home to the Krishnamurti Retreat Centre. Situated in the beautiful countryside of the South Downs National Park, the Krishnamurti Centre offers retreats individually and in groups. The focus is on inquiry in light of Krishnamurti's teachings. Please visit krishnamurticentre.org.uk for more information. You can also find our regular quotes and videos on Instagram, TikTok and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a review or rating on your podcast app, which helps our visibility. This week's episode on What Is has four sections. This first extract is from Krishnamurti's second talk in Ojai, 1983, titled What Is and What Should Be. We are questioning together, you and the other friend are questioning whether we are individuals at all or we are like the rest of humanity. The rest of humanity is unhappy, sorrow-ridden, fearful, believing in some fantastic, romantic nonsense. They go through great suffering, uncertainty, like you. And our reactions, which is part of our consciousness, is similar to the other. This is a absolute fact. You may not like to think about it. You might like to think that you are totally separate from another, which is quite absurd. So your consciousness, which is you, what you think, what you believe, what your conclusions, prejudices, your vanity, arrogance, aggression, pain, grief, sorrow, is shared by all humanity. That's our conditioning. Whether you are a Catholic or a Protestant or whatever you are. So, our consciousness is your essence, what you 
what your life is. That is the truth. And so you actually share the rest of humanity. You are the rest of humanity. You are humanity. This is a tremendous thing to realize. You may believe in certain form of a saviour, and the other believe in certain form of ideologies and so on. Belief is common to all of us. Fear is common to all of us. Loneliness, the agony of loneliness, is shared by the rest of humanity. So, when one realises the truth of that, becoming, that is, to change from what is to what should be, has a totally different meaning. The friend says, I don't understand that at all. What do you mean by that? The friend says, I don't quite know, but let's examine it. I hope you're all following all this, because it's your life, not mine. It's your daily life. Whether you live in this valley, New York and other big cities, all the cities of the world. It's our life. We have to understand that, not from another, but to examine the facts of our life, to look at ourselves as you would look at yourself when you're combing your hair or shaving. Objectively, sanely, rationally, without any distortion, seeing things as they are, and not be frightened or ashamed, but to observe. So the friend says, All my life I've tried to change from what is to what should be. I know violence, disorder, I've known all that very well. And that disorder and violence I've tried to change. That is to become from violence to non violence, from disorder to order. Now, is there, the other friend says, is there this fly likes me? The other friend says, Is non violence a fact? Or just an imaginary conclusion, a reaction from the fact of violence? I hope we understand each other. I'm violent, I project the idea of non-violence, but that's part of my conditioning. I 
I live in disorder and I try to seek order. That is to change what is to what should be. That's part of becoming. And that may be the cause of conflict. And so he said, let's examine that carefully. You are examining it, not the speaker is examining it. I must constantly, one must constantly remember that. And the speaker will constantly remind his friend that he is not a one-sided conversation. It's not one-sided commun- communication. We have both of us think the friends, you and the speaker, are observing all this. The speaker is expressing it in words, but you are also observing not only the words but the facts. So the French says, can this violence end, not become non-violent? Can envy, greed, fear end, not become courageous, free from this or that? That is the question. So, the other friend says, I'll show it to you. Only, perhaps this may be new to you, so please kindly listen most attentively. First, realise what we are doing. That is, what is to become the ideal, which is what should be. The ideal is non-existent, is non-fact. But what is, is a fact. Right? So, let's understand what is, and not the idea of non-violence, which is absurd. This has been preached by various people in India, beginning with Tolstoy and others. This is our tradition, this is our conditioning. This is our attempt to become something. And we have never achieved anything. We have never become non-violent. Never. So, let's examine carefully it is possible to end that which is, to end that disorder or violence. End, not become something. You, I hope we understand each other. The becoming implies time. This is very important to understand. When we talk about fear, which we share presently, we will go into the question of time, which is extraordinarily complex. So, so, let's understand whether it is possible to end what is, not to change what is in that which we would like to be. will take the question of violence, and if you prefer disorder, both are the same, it doesn't matter what you take. Violence is inherited from beyond all time, from the most, from the animal through the ape and to us, we have inherited it. 
That's a fact. We are wild people. Otherwise, we wouldn't be killing anybody. We wouldn't be hurting anybody. We wouldn't say a word against anybody. But we are, by nature, violent. Now, what is, what is the meaning of that word? To hold that word, see the weight of that word, the complications of that word, not merely physical violence, the terrorists throwing bomb, bombs, those terrorists who want to change society through various forms of disturbance and bombing and so on, they have never changed society. And there are the terrorists who do it for the fun of it. Violence is not only physical, but psychological, much more. Violence is conformity. Because to conform to something, not understand what is, but to be conform, imitate. And violence must exist as long as there is division outwardly and inwardly. Conflict is the very nature of violence. The friend says, yes, I see that. That's very clear. Now, how do you end it? How do you end the whole complex question of violence? He says, I understand very well that to become non-violent is a part of violence. Right? Part of violence. Because you are, you are projected from violence, non-violence. And I understand that very clearly. That projection is really illusion. So I have rejected that concept or that idea, that feeling that you must become non-violent. He says, I understand that very clearly. There is only this fact. Now, what am I to do? And the friend says, don't ask me Listen carefully. Don't ask me, but let's look at it. The moment you ask what to do or how to do, you put the other fellow as your guide. You make him your authority. Therefore, friendship ceases. So together, let's look at it. Being free altogether from the idea of non-violence, observe what is violence. Look at it. Give attention to the fact. Not escape from it. Not rationalize it. Don't say, why you shouldn't be violent, it's part of myself. But if, you are, if that is part of yourself, you will always create wars of different kinds. 
wars between yourself and your wife, wars between killing others and so on. So, look at it without conflict. You understand? Look at it as though it was not separate from you. You understand all this? This is rather difficult. Which is, violence is part of you, you are violent. Like you are greedy. Greed is not separate from you. Suffering is not separate from you. Anxiety, loneliness, depression, all that is you. But our tradition, our education has said you are separate from that. Right? So, where there is separation, where there is duality, there must be conflict. Like the Jew, Arab, I'm taking that, probably you'll understand that better. Between the conflict of two great powers, division, and so on. So, it's you, you are that. You are not separate from that. The analyzer is not different from the analyzed. Right? I hope you're. The, the friend says, I, I follow this a little more. Go on, explain a bit more. She says, I will. We observe the tree, the mountains. You observe your wife and your children. And who is the observer? And who is the observed? Please, I'm going to carefully follow this. Is the observer different from the tree? Of course he is different, I hope. The observer is different from that mountain. The observer is different from the computer. But is the observer different from anxiety? The anxiety is a reaction put into words as anxiety, but the feeling is you. The word is different. Please follow this. The word is different, but the word is never the thing. The thing is the feeling of anxiety, feeling of violence. The word violence is not that. So watch carefully that the word doesn't entangle your observation. <coughs> you follow? Because our brain is caught in a network of words. When I say you're an American, you feel very proud. When I call myself South African or a Zulu, I feel you follow something totally different. So one must be very careful that the language doesn't condition our thinking. This is quite a different problem. Right? So I'm we say the friend says to the other, observe this feeling without the word. If you use the word, you strengthen the past memories of that particular feeling. Are you following? This is the act of observation, in which the word is not the thing, and the observer is the observed. The observer who says, I am violent, that observer is violence. 
Right? So, the observer is the observed. The thinker is the thought. The experiencer who says, I must experience nirvana or heaven or whatever, is the, is the experience, right? The analyzer is the analyzer and so on. So, look at that fact of that feeling without the word, without analyzing it, just look. That is, be with it. Be with this thing as is. Which means you bring to it all your attention to it. Right? By analyzing, examining, that's all waste of energy. Whereas if you give your total attention, of, which is give all your energy to the feeling, then that feeling has total ending. The friend says, are you mesmerizing me? by being so vehement, by being so passionate about it? He said, no. I'm not, I'm not stimulating you. I'm not telling you what to do. You, have, you yourself have realized that non-violence is non-fact, it's not real. What is real is violence. You yourself have realized it. You yourself have said, yes, I am violence, not I am separate from the violence. The word separates. But the fact of the feeling is me. Me is my nose, my eyes, my face, my name, my character, my... That's me. I'm not separate from all that. When you separate, you act upon it. Right? Which means conflict. Therefore, you have fundamentally erased the cause of conflict. When you are, when you are that, not separate from that. Is this clear? Right? So we have, the friends have learned something. I have learned a great phenomena which I have never realized before. Before I have separated my feelings as though I was different from my feeling. Now I realize the truth that I am that. Therefore I remain with it. And when you remain with it, hold it, you are off that, that gives you tremendous energy. And that energy dissipates, ends that violence completely. Not for a day, not while you are sitting here, but it's the end of it. The second extract is from the third talk at Brockwood Park in 1978, titled What Is Has No Opposite. Because as long as we live in opposites, jealousy and non-jealousy, the good and the bad, the ignorant and the enlightened, there must be this constant Conflict in duality. Of course, there is duality: man, woman, light and shade, dark, light and darkness, morning and evening, and so on. 
But psychologically, inwardly, we are asking whether there is an opposite at all. Is goodness the outcome of that which is bad? If it is the outcome of that which is bad, evil, I don't like to to use the word evil because that's so appallingly misused as every other word in English language. If goodness is the opposite of the bad, then that very goodness is the outcome of the bad. Therefore, it is not goodness. Right? Do we see in ourselves, not as an idea, as a conclusion, as something somebody has suggested to you, but actually, do we see anything born out of an opposite must contain its own opposite? So if that is so, then there is only what is, which has no opposite. Right? Somebody meeting me, we are meeting each other. So as long as we have an opposite, there cannot be freedom. Goodness is totally unrelated to that which is evil, which is bad, in quotes, bad. As long as we are violent, to have the opposite, which is non violent, creates a conflict, and the non-violence is born out of violence. The idea of non-violence is the outcome of being aggressive, abrasive, anger and so on. So there is only violence, not its opposite. then we can deal with violence. As long as we have an opposite, then we are trying to achieve the opposite. I wonder for me. Sava? So, is freedom the opposite of non freedom? Or freedom has nothing whatsoever to do with its opposite. This, please, we have to understand this very carefully because we're going to go into something, which is: is love the opposite of hate? The opposite of jealousy? The opposite of A sensation. So, as long as we are living in this habit of opposites, which we are, I must, I must not, I am, I shall be, I have been, and in the future something will take place. All this is the activity, the movement of the opposites. Right, so do we, may we go on, Babel? So I'm, we're asking, is freedom totally unrelated to that which we call non-freedom?
If it is, then how is that freedom to be lived, understood and acted, from which action takes place? We have always acted from the opposites, right? I am in prison and I must be free of it. I must get out. I am in bondage to um, to a habit, psychologically as well as physiologically, and I must be free of it to become something else. Right? So we are caught in the habit of this everlasting corridor of opposites. And so there is never an ending to conflict, to struggle, to be this and not that. Is this, I think this is fairly clear. Can we go on from there? Uh, you are not listening to me. You are discovering this for yourself. If you are, it has, it has significance, meaning and can be lived daily. But if you are merely accepting the idea of it from another, from the speaker, then you are merely living in the world of ideas. And therefore the opposites remain. The word idea, the root meaning of it from Greek and so on, is to observe. See what we have made of that word. Just to observe and not conclude or make an abstract from what you have observed into an idea. You. So we are caught in ideas and we never observe. If we do observe, we make an abstraction of it into an idea. So we are saying, freedom is unconnected with, with bondage, whether it is the bondage of habit physical or psychological, bondage of attachment and so on. So there is only freedom, not its opposite. If we understand that the truth of it, then we are then we will deal only with what is and not with what should be, which is its opposite. I've got it. Are we meeting each other somewhere? Right? May we go on? So if that is very clear, that there is only the fact, the what is, and and there is no up opposite to what is. See, what, if you un, if you understand that basically the truth of it, you are dealing with facts, unemotionally, unsentimentally. Then you can do something. The fact itself will do something. <coughs> but as long as we move away from the fact. The fact and the opposite will continue. You want? <coughs> so we are asking now if that is clear, not because somebody said so, because you have discovered this for yourself. Fundamentally, it's yours, not mine.
The third extract is from the eighth discussion in Sanan 1970, titled, What is contains the past, present and future. Now we're going to, this morning, find out, learn together the what happens to a mind and to the brain, the brain, the mind, the whole being, that is the psychosomatic, both the body, the brain, the heart, the mind, the whole thing, what takes place when a mind is tremendously attentive. Now, to understand that very clearly, or find out, learn about it for oneself, (coughs) one must first see that the description is not the described. One can describe the tent, this tent, with all the holes and the everything involved, the tent. But the description is not the tent. The word is not the thing. And of that we must be absolutely clear from the beginning that the explanation is not the explained, and to be caught in description, in explanation, is the childish, most childish form of of living, which I am afraid most of us do. We are satisfied with the description, with the explanation, with saying that is the cause, and just float along. But whereas what we are going to do this morning is to find out for ourselves the quality of a mind or what has happened to the mind, mind being the brain as well as the whole psychosomatic structure, what happens to the mind when there is this extraordinary attention when there is no center as this observer or as the sensor. To understand that, to really learn about it, not merely satisfied with the speaker's explanation of it, one has to find out, one has to begin with the understanding of what is. What is. Not what should be or what has been, but what is. Please go with me. Let's travel together. It's great fun if we we move together to... in learning. Because Obviously, there must be tremendous changes in the world and in ourselves. Obviously, the ways of our thought and action has, have become so utterly immature, so contradictory, so <coughs> diabolical, if one can say so. You invent a machine to kill, and then the, there is an anti-machine to kill that machine, anti, 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 you follow? That's what they're doing in the world. Not only socially, but also mechanically. And a mind that is really concerned, involved in the seriousness of psychological as well as outward change, must go into this problem of 
the human being, with his consciousness, with his despairs, with his appalling fears, with his ambitions, with his anxieties, with his desire to fulfil in some form or another. So, to understand all this, and we cannot go back to begin all over again because we have been through it, we must begin with seeing what is. What is is not only what is in front of you, but what is beyond. To see what is in front of you, you must have a very clear perception, uncontaminated, not prejudiced, not involved in the desire to go beyond it, but just to observe it. Not only to observe what is, but what has been, which is also what is. The what is, is the past, is the present and is the future. Do do see that thing. So the what is, is not static, it's a movement. And to keep with that movement, with the movement of what is, you need to have a very clear mind. You need to have unprejudiced, un- not distorted mind. That means there is distortion the moment there is an effort. Right? I can't see what is and go beyond it. The mind can't see it. If the mind is in any way concerned with the change of what is, or trying to go beyond it, or trying to suppress it, and To observe what is, you need energy, right? To observe attentively to anything, you need energy. To listen to what you are saying, I need energy. That is, I need energy when I really desperately want to understand what you are saying. But if I am not interested, but casually think that just, you know, that's a very uh, slight energy that soon dissipates. <coughs> so to understand what is, you need energy. Now, these fragmentations which, of which we are, is the division of these energies. You understand? I and the not I, anger and not anger, violence and not violence, they are all fragmentations of energy. Right? And when one fragment assumes the authority over the other fragments, it is an energy that functions in fragments. Are we meeting each other? Are we communicating? That means, communication means learning together, working together, creating together, seeing together, understanding together, not just I speak and you listen and say, well, intellectually I grasp it. That's not understanding. The whole thing is 
a movement in learning, therefore in action. So I so the mind sees that all fragmentations as nation, not nation, my God, your God, my belief and your belief, you know, this con is fragmentation of energy. There is only energy and fragmentation. This energy is fragmented by thought. And thought is the way of conditioning, which we have gone into, which we won't go into now, because it's, we must move further. So consciousness is the totality of these fragmentations of energy. And we said the frag this fragmentation of energy one of that fragmentation is the observer is the me is the monkey that is incessantly active right May go on they bearing in mind the description is not the described that you are watching yourself watching yourself through the words of the speaker but the words are not the thing therefore the speaker becomes very little important importance what becomes important is your observation of yourself how this energy has been fragmented jealousy non jealousy uh, hate you know Now, to see that, which is what is, can you see that without the, without a fragment, as the observer? You understand? Huh? Can the mind see these many fragmentations which make up of the whole of consciousness? And these fragmentations are the fragmentations of energy. Energy. Can the mind see this without, as an, an observer who is part of the many fragments? Because it is important to understand this. When we are talking of attention, if the mind cannot see the many fragments without or through the eyes of another fragment, then you will never understand what is attention. I don't know. Are we meeting each other? Don't say please. Are we meeting each other? I see, the mind sees, what fragmentation does, outwardly and inwardly. Outwardly, sovereign governments, with arms and all the rest of it. Outwardly, the division of nationalities, beliefs, religious dogmas, division. My God, your God, my belief, outwardly. In social action, division, political action, division, the Labour Party, the Conservative, the Communist, non-Communist, Socialist, the Capitalist, you follow? All created with the desire 
of thought which says I must be secure. Right? Thought thinks it will be secure through fragmentation. Right? And so creates more fragmentations. Huh? <laughs> Do you see this? Not verbally, not actually as a fact. The young and the old, the rich, you follow? This constant division, death and living. Do you see this movement of fragmentation by thought, which has, which is caught in the conditioning of these fragmentations? Do you does do you does the mind see this whole movement of fragmentation? Without a center that says I see them. You because the moment you have a center. That center becomes the factor of division. Me and not me, which is you. I don't know, please. And thought has put together this me. Through the desire or through the impulse to find security, safety, and in its desire to find safety it has divided energy as the me and not the me, <coughs> and therefore bringing to itself insecurity. Now can, can the mind see this as a whole? And it cannot see it as a whole if there is a fragmentation which observes. We are asking what is the quality of the mind that is highly attentive, in which there is no fragmentation. Right? That's what we left off yesterday, where we left off. What is the quality of the mind? I don't know what you have, if you have gone through it, inquired or learned from yesterday, and uh, the speaker is not a professor teaching you or giving you information, but to find that out. There is, must be no fragmentation, obviously, which means no effort. Effort means distortion, and a mind, as most of our minds, are distorted. You cannot possibly understand what it is to be completely attentive and Find out what has happened to a mind that is so utterly aware, utterly attentive. The final extract in this episode is from Krishnamurti's fourth talk at Brockwood Park in 1973, titled the cessation of what is. So we are investigating what time is, because without understanding that 
when if the mind is not free of time it cannot possibly look into something which is timeless which is maybe sacred you understand so i'm the mind must clearly understand what time is all this is meditation you understand not just one part the whole of this morning's talk is the movement in meditation what is time apart from the chronological time time is movement from here to there psychologically as well as physically from here to that house so the movement between this and that is time the space between this and that the covering of that is time the movement to that is time so all movement is time hmm? both physically going from here to uh, paris new york whatever you will wherever you will requires time and also psychologically to change what is into what should be requires time the movement at least we think so so time is movement in space created by thought as this and achieving that you are thought it then is time thought is movement in time uh, come on sir does this mean anything to any of you uh, you you coming we are journeying together i'll go on i won't ask any more <laughs> please this requires tremendous attention care a sense of non personal non pleasurable where desire and doesn't enter into it at all that requires great care and that care brings its own order which is its own discipline so, so thought is movement between what is and what should be thought is time to cover that space and as long as there is the division between this and that psychologically the movement is time of thought so thought is time as movement right and is there time as movement as thought when there is only observation of what is which is the observation as the observer and the observed not as the observer and the observed but only the observation without the movement of going beyond what is are you getting this
Are you all paralyzed? <laughs> it's very important for the mind to understand this. Because ta- ta- thought can create most marvelous images of, of that which is sacred and holy. Which you, all religions have done. All religions are based on thought. All religions are the organization of thought in belief, in dogma, in ritual. So unless there is complete understanding of this thought as time and movement, you, the mind cannot possibly go beyond itself. As we said, we are trained, educated, drilled into changing what is into what should be. The ideal. And the word ideal comes from the word idea, which means to see, only that, not draw an abstraction from what you see, but actually remain with what you see. So we are trained to change what is into what should be. That training is the movement of thought to cover the space between what is and what should be, and that takes time. That whole movement of thought in space is time necessary to change what is to what should be? The observer is the observed, therefore there is nothing to change. You won't get it. I'll, I'll go on. I'll keep my eyes shut because I'll go on. Hmm? Because there is only what is. The observer doesn't know how to, what to do with what is. Therefore, he tries various methods of, to change what is, controls what is, tries to suppress actually what is. But, what, but the observer is the observed. The what is is the observer. Like anger, jealousy come exists. Jealousy is the is also the observer. There isn't jealousy isn't separate from the observer. Both are one. So when there is no movement to change what is, you say movement as thought in time, when thought perceives that there is no possibility of changing what is, then that which is what is ceases entirely because the observer is the observed. You go into this very deeply, you will see it yourself. It's really quite simple. I dislike someone. So the dislike is different from me and the you. Entity that dislikes is dislike itself, it is not separate. 
And when thought says, I must get over my dislike, then it is movement in time to get over that which actually is, which is created by thought. So the observer, the entity and the thing called dislike are the same. Therefore, there is complete immobility. which is not the immobility of status, it is completely motionless, therefore completely silent. So time as movement, time as thought achieving a result, has come totally to an end. Therefore, action is instantaneous. So the mind has laid the foundation and is free from disorder. Therefore there is the flowering and the beauty of virtue that is the basis. And in that foundation is the relationship between you and another. In that relationship there is no activity of image, there is only relationship, not the image adjusting itself to the other image. And there is only what is, and not the changing of what is. The changing of what is or transforming what is is the movement of is the movement of thought in time. Then, when you have come to that point, the mind and the brain cells also become totally still. The brain, which holds the memories, experiences, knowledge, can and must function in the field of the known. But now the mind, that brain, is free from the activity of time and thought. Then the mind is completely still. All this takes place without effort. All this must take place without any sense of discipline, control. All that belongs to disorder. You know what we are saying is something totally different from what your gurus, your um, masters, your Zen philosophy, your all that. Because in this there is no authority, there is no following another. Because if you follow somebody, you are not only destroying yourself but also the other. Therefore, a religious mind has no authority whatsoever, but it has got intelligence. And it applies that intelligence where in the world of action there is authority of the doctor, the scientist, the man who teaches you how to drive. Otherwise there is no authority. 
There is no guru. So the mind then, if you have gone as deeply as that, then the mind having established order in relationship and that order is virtue, then understanding the whole complex disorder of our lives, of our daily lives, and in the comprehension, in the awareness of that disorder, in which there is no choice, out of that comes beauty of virtue, which is not cultivated, which is not brought about by thought. Therefore that virtue is love, order. And if you, if the mind has not based, has not established that as with deep roots, which is immovable, unchangeable, then you can inquire into this whole movement of time, as we somewhat did. Then. The mind is completely still, there is no observer, there is no experiencer, there is no thinker. And going, coming to that point, there are various forms of sensory and extrasensory perceptions. clairvoyance, healing, all kinds of things take place, but they are all secondary issues, and a mind that is really concerned in the discovery of what is truth, what is sacred, will never touch all that. Because they are secondary issues. So the mind then is free to observe, then there is that thing which man has sought through centuries, the unnameable, the timeless. And no description, no verbal expression of it, the image that is created by that, by thought, completely and utterly ceases. For there is no entity that wants to express it in words. That the mind, your mind, can only discover or come upon it when you have this strange thing called love, compassion. Not to only to your neighbour, but your, to the animal, to the trees, to everything. Then such a mind itself becomes sacred. 